when Tiffany and I got married uh, 26 years ago, I had some major trust issues, and I didn't even know that I had trust issues. I had not dealt with the trauma of being sexually abused uh, when I was a teenager, and I did not deal with the unhealth that I grew up in in just a dysfunctional home. I hadn't dealt with all of that trauma and all of that junk. And so when I got married to Tiffany, I had all of this untrust. Just, I just had distrust, and I was always questioning Tiffany's motives. Why would you do that? Why would you say that? I mean, I was just, all, I just did not trust. I, I thought Tiffany was going to leave me. I come on, I, thought, I know she's gone today. I know I just had so much insecurity, so much lack of trust. And I thank God for the work of the Holy Spirit. God has done such a great work of healing in my life and taught me to trust. But here's what I've learned about life. A lot of people have trust issues. Some of you have trust issues. Issues. Here's the definition of trust. If you kind of just look up trust, it talks about a firm belief in the reliability, the truth, ability, strength of someone or something. And a lot of people don't have a firm belief in, and, and a firm trust in people in their own family, even with their own friends. They have trust issues. And one thing that's interesting to me is how we don't trust the people we do know. We don't trust the people we do know, but we'll trust the people that we don't know. My, my, my family, over spring break, we went to Florida. We went to go see Kel Cooper, our oldest son. He is a sophomore in college in Lakeland, Florida, so we wanted to go see him uh, when we were in the Dallas airport, our plane got delayed, and it got delayed, and it got delayed, it got delayed, and our flight did not leave until around 12 a.m. in the morning. And I, it, here's what went through my mind. Are the pilots okay? <laughs> they got enough rest. It's a long flight. It's late. They're doing okay, but I, I went on and got on the plane. You know what I'm saying? I trusted the pilots. Come on, you get in an Uber in a city that you visited. Come on, get in an Uber. You don't know that brother? You don't know that sister? Are they really taking you to the right location? Come on, we trust the chef in the kitchen. We trust the barista that we don't know in the coffee shop. We trust the mechanic fixing our brakes or the tire shop tightening our lugs on our tires. We just, we trust. We trust the post office, FedEx, UPS, Amazon to get our package delivered to the right address. Something else that's interesting is a lot of people trust the airline pilot, the Uber driver, the mechanic more than they trust God. Christians will trust God with their eternity, but they have a hard time trusting God with their life. A lot of Christians have trust issues. People pray the prayer of salvation, and they trust God with their future, but they don't have a hard time trusting God with their now. They trust God to get them to their eternal destination, but they have a hard time trusting God to help them get them to their earthly destinations. And as we begin this new series, the only way that you and I will stay in our lane, the only way that you're going to fulfill your God-given purpose is to learn to trust God with your life and not just with your eternity. To trust God with your life, you have to understand a couple of very important theological truths. And I want to give you a couple of theological truths that are so foundational for every Christ follower. And the first truth is God has a purpose and plan for your life. If you're going to trust God with your life, you must understand that God made you. And that God has a plan and purpose for your life. Church, you're not an accident. You're not on earth by chance. It's not a coincidence. It's not by luck. No, God created you. It was his idea for you to be on the planet. And God has a specific plan and purpose for your life. People in the Bible 
they understood this very important theological truth. I, I want to just kind of give you a lot of the word of God today that, that you could begin to understand God has a purpose. He has a plan for my life. Isaiah chapter number 44 and verse 2. It says, this is what the Lord says. He made you who formed you in the womb and who will help you. God made you. He formed all of us in our mother's womb. Isaiah chapter 49 verse 1. Listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my mother's womb, he has spoken my name. God calls you and me to accomplish his purpose before we were even born. God has a plan for you. He has a plan for me. Before we came out of our mother's womb, God had a plan. Isaiah chapter 49, verse number 5. Now, and now the Lord speaks, the one who formed me in my mother's womb to be his servant, who commissioned me to bring Israel back to him. God formed you in your mother's womb. He has a plan and a purpose for your life. I'm laying some theological foundation for your heart and for your life as we kick off this series. Job chapter 14, verse 5. A person's days are determined. You have decreed the number of his months and have set the limits he cannot exceed. God numbered the days of our lives, and he set limits we cannot exceed. God created each of us on purpose and with limits. I have limits. God made me. He designed me. He has a purpose for my life. I have limits. I can't sing. I want to. I try. I want to be a singing preacher. I think I'd be more effective. If I could talk to God about distributing gifts to me, I'd say, God, help a brother out. I'll fly away, oh glory. No, it's, not, it's just not my thing. I, I'll never be 6'9 and in the NBA. I wanted to be. Not 6'9". God, God gave me limits. He has a unique purpose for my life. So he put limits on my life. And the same thing is true for you. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. God has appointed you to accomplish certain things and to impact certain people. Listen, there are God ordained appointments for your life. There are experience and people that God has appointed for your life. There are opportunities that God has appointed for your life. There are some jobs and assignments God has appointed for your life. Before you were born, God set you apart and he appointed certain things for your life. The apostle Paul understood this truth. This very important theological truth that has to be deep in our hearts. Galatians chapter 1 verse 5, verse 15. Listen to what the apostle Paul says. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased. God set you apart from your mother's womb and he called you to accomplish certain things by his grace. I need a little help as I lay a little theological foundation. Just look at your neighbor and just tell them this. God has called you to some things. Would you tell them that right now? Come on, help, help your pastor out. Yeah, God has called you to some things. You have to understand this about your great God. Let's keep looking at the Bible. Let's keep digging deep. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 23. Lord, I know that people's lives are not their own. It is not for them to direct their steps. Because we have been created by God, set apart by God, appointed and called by God. Our lives are not our own. We belong to God. We don't want to direct our own steps. We don't want to follow our own plans. We want to follow God's plan. We want to allow him to direct our steps. And today and throughout this series, here's what I want to do. I want to look at the life of David. David understood this very important theological truth that God created him and that God had a plan for his life. David did not direct his own steps. He followed God's plan and purpose for his life. David wrote these words in Psalm chapter 40, verse number 5. Many, Lord, my God, are the wonders you have done, the things you have planned for us. None can compare with you. Were I, were, were I to speak and to tell of your deeds, they would be too many to declare. David knew God had planned things for his life long ago. 
He knew God had some experiences, some people, some opportunities, some jobs, some assignments already planned for his life. And because David had this deep conviction, he trusted God. David wrote these words in Psalm chapter 139 and verse 13, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. He goes on to say in verse 16, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Church, David trusted God because he understood that God knit him together in his mother's womb. He understood before he came out of his mother's womb, God already had a plan and purpose for his life. And I want you to see how this practically played out in David's life. In Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 16, God chose David to be the next king of Israel. And what's interesting about this story is when God chose David to be the next king of Israel, David was clueless. Let me take you back to God's word. First Samuel chapter 16. Now we're diving into the life of David. I've laid a theological foundation for you. God created us. He has a plan for us. God created us. He has a plan for us. God created us. He has a plan for us. Now David understood this truth, and we're going to see how it practically plays out in David's life. First Samuel chapter 16, verse 1. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I I have chosen one of his sons to be king. God told the prophet Samuel that he already had chosen the next king, which was David. But David did not have a clue. Here's the big takeaway. Here's the big takeaway. You have to understand, church, that God has a plan and a purpose for your life. Church, God ordains your days before you came out of your mother's womb. Since this is true, it means God is the one who gives you opportunities. God is the one who gives you leadership positions. God is the one who gives you promotions. Your promotions and opportunities come from the Lord. Here's what David wrote in Psalm chapter 75, verse 7. It is God who judges. He brings one down. He exalts another. David had a deep conviction that God is the one. Who promotes? God was the one who removed King Saul from being the king of Israel. And God was the one who exalted David to become the next king. What we learn from David is we need to trust God to bring his purpose and his plan to pass in our lives. When you really understand and believe this biblical truth, you begin to trust God at a deeper level. Because you know, you're confident. That God has a plan and purpose for your life. You're confident. You have a deep conviction that God has opportunities for you. He has assignments for you. He has people and jobs for your life. And if you will follow God, he will bring his plan and his purpose to pass in your life. God will promote you and elevate you to where he wants you to be. If you will trust God. David trusted God. David trusted God. Psalm chapter 22, verse 9. This is David. You were, you, yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you. Even at my mother's breast, David trusted God from an early age. Psalm chapter 71, verse 6. This is David. From birth, I have relied on you. You brought me forth from my mother's womb. I will ever praise you because David knew God had a purpose for his life. Notice what it says. He relied on God. He leaned on God. He trusted God's plan and God's purpose for his life. One of my favorite scriptures about David, Acts chapter 13, verse 36. Just look at your neighbor and say, I think this dude likes the Bible. Go ahead and tell him that, yeah. I think he likes the Bible. Acts chapter 13, verse 36. Now when David has served God's, everybody shout the next word. If you have a paper Bible with you right now, would you circle God's purpose? Now when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. He was buried with his ancestors and his body decayed. What set David apart from most people 
is he didn't direct his own steps. He trusted God's plan and purpose for his life. Many people don't live out God's purpose for their life. They live out their purpose for their life. They pursue their dream instead of God's dream. They pursue what they want instead of what God wants. They pursue their will instead of God's will. They trust their plan instead of God's plan. People get distracted. You and I easily get distracted from God's purpose for our life. So many people, they spend their life focusing on a position instead of on God's purpose, on promotion instead of on purpose, on prominence instead of on purpose, on prestige or popularity instead of on God's purpose. But when you study the life of David, you ought to do it on your own. I've been studying it. When you study the life of David, you will never see him focused on getting a position or prominence or prestige or popularity. He was focused. He was laser focused on living out God's purpose for his life. Check out this next verse of scripture in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 5. Verse 5. Samuel replied, yes, in peace I have come to, to the sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then, consecrated, he, then, then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited, notice them, he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. Samuel invited all of Jesse's sons to the sacrifice. At this sacrifice, the next king of Israel is going to be selected, and he's going to be anointed the next king of Israel. Then I want you to notice what happens next in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse number 11. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? I've checked them all out. They're in the house. None of them are the next king. He said, well, they're still the youngest, Jesse answered. He's tending the sheep. Samuel said, well, send for him. We're not even going to sit down until that brother arrives. Now, now, question, church, question. Why wasn't David at the sacrifice? He was invited. Did his father tell him not to come? Did his brothers tell him, since you're the youngest, you don't need to be at the sacrifice, you snot and nose punk. There's no way you're going to be the next king. You're the youngest. I'm not exactly sure why David wasn't at the sacrifice. But what's rather interesting to me is David never tried to make himself the next king. He wasn't in the house with the rest of the brothers seeking after a position or seeking after a promotion. David trusted God with his life and his future. He had a deep conviction that what God had for him was for him. And as long as he followed God, the Lord would bring his plan and purpose to pass in his life. His brothers, here's what David believed, church, you got to get this. He, he believed his brothers could not stop his destiny. They couldn't steal or stop the purpose that God had for his life. David had such a deep conviction in God that even after he was appointed to be the next king, here's what he did, church. It's, it's, it's such an interesting story. He went right back to taking care of the sheep. David never sought after a position. He didn't try to make it happen and force himself to be the next king of Israel. Matter of fact, let's look at this next scripture. I want you to see this. First Samuel chapter 16, verse 13. So Samuel took the horn of oil, and he anointed him, anointed David in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. And then it says in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 19, Then Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send me your son David. Now catch this church. He's been anointed to be the next king. The Spirit of God's on him to be the king. And it says, Who is with the sheep? David was selected and anointed, anointed to be the next king, and the Spirit of God came upon him in power to be the next king. But this dude is right back taking care of the sheep. He wasn't seeking a position. He was seeking God's purpose. Let me tell you what a lot of us would have done if we'd have got anointed to be the next king. Uh, come on, we'd have changed our social media account name. Come on. The next king anointed 
and appointed. Come on, somebody. You, you, you know? You know what you'd have done? We would have tried to help God out. Come on. Anybody ever try to help God out? We, wait a minute. We, we wouldn't have been with that sheep. We'd have been focused on a position instead of on purpose. We'd have been trying to make it happen. We'd have been trying to force it to happen. But David trusted God's plan and purpose, and he went right back to taking care of the sheep. And what happened next in David's life reveals the deep level of trust he had in God. King Saul, I catch this, here's what happens next. King Saul was being tormented by a demon. So he called David to the palace to play the harp for the king, to kind of soothe him. The music was going to soothe him. And David obeyed the king's command, and he went to the palace. He played the harp for the king. Now, now, catch this. When David got to the palace, he didn't try to make himself the king. He was anointed. The Spirit of God came on him to be the next king. But he didn't try to usurp the king. He didn't go around telling all the workers at the palace, have you heard? Have you heard? I'm going to be the next king. Do you know who I am? Have you checked out my social media account? No, he didn't try to manipulate the situation. He didn't try to make himself king. No, no. Da you know what David did? David trusted God and served the king. He played the harp and trusted God. He focused on seeking God's purpose, not a position. David, oh God, help us today. Help us, Lord. David had a deep conviction that what God had for him was for him. No one could stop God's plan and purpose for his life, not even the current king. All he needed to do was trust and follow God. Church, let me bring this to where you live. Some of you are not living out God's purpose for your life because you're seeking after the wrong things. You have the wrong focus. You're seeking position. You're seeking promotion. You're seeking prominence, prestige, popularity. Instead of seeking after God's purpose. You're not trusting God. Or if you're honest with yourself today, you're not trusting God. You trust yourself. You're spending all of your energy fighting for a position. You're spending all of your time trying to make yourself look good and trying to make them look bad. You're trying to prove yourself to people, trying to manipulate people, manipulate the circumstances. You're tearing other people down just trying to make yourself look good. You're consumed with jealousy. And if you're not trusting God, you're consumed with jealousy, envy. Why does that person have that job? Why do they have that position? Ah. I should have that position. I'm better than them. I'm more qualified than them. I've got more experience than them. And perhaps all of that is true. It was true for David. I mean, King Saul had a demon. And David had God's spirit on his life. David was definitely more spiritually qualified to be the king. But his focus wasn't a position. It was on God's purpose. Here's the question. Here's the question. Here's the question I want you to wrestle with this week. And we're going to go into a moment, a time of worship. But here's the question. Every location, lean in. If you're sleeping with your eyes open, wake up. Wake up. I need you to wrestle with this this week. I need you to wrestle. Wrestle with this question. Are you focused on serving God's purpose? Or is your focus on a position? Promotion, prominence, prestige, popularity. Wrestle with this, church. Do you trust God with your future, with your life, or just with your eternity? Are you leaning on God? Wrestle with this. Are you leaning on God? Or are you leaning on yourself? Pastor, here's the question. Some of you are wondering. Pastor, how do I trust God with my life? How do I trust God with my future? What does it practically look like to trust God with my life and my future? Pastor, you're messing with me today? 
Pastor, if I shouldn't make the focus of my life a position, if I shouldn't make the focus of my life a promotion or, or prominence or prestige or popularity, what should I be focused on? I'm confused, Pastor. What do I focus on? Tell me. Don't miss next Sunday. Don't, miss, don't, you, don't, you, don't you miss next Sunday? And don't miss one week of this series because I'm going to tell you what you should be focused on and what you should do to stay in your lane and so that you can live out God's purpose for your life. My prayer for you today, may this be said of you. Acts 13, verse number 36. Now when David, now when Herbert, now when Jim, now when Tony, now when Samantha had served God's purpose in his own generation, they fell asleep and buried with their ancestors. And may we serve God's purpose. Please don't leave early. I asked the worship team to select this song. I requested it because I believe you got to know he has good plans. I believe you got to know he has a plan and a purpose for your life. I need every location to stand on their feet. If you're comfortable, would you lift your hands to God? Don't leave out. Please don't leave. We got plenty of time. Come on. Would you lift your hands and say, God, I trust your plans. Help me to trust you. Help me to trust your plan. Help me to trust your purpose. Help me to trust you, God. Come on, every location. Lift those hands up, Midwest City, Northwest, Edmond, Mabel Bassett. Come on, trust God. Come on, trust God. Trust God. somebody I'm talking to you trust God he's got good plans you don't have to manipulate it you have to, you don't have to tear them down any longer God has a plan for you he has a purpose for you he has destiny for you he has positions for you he has jobs for you he has people for you he has assignments for you he has resources for you would you lean on God come on sir come on ma'am would you trust God Come on, would you trust God? He can get you there. He can take you there. He can give you the promotion. He can give you the raise. But you got to trust him. Come on, church, one more time. Would you trust God right now? Come on, Midwest City. Come on, Northwest. Come on, Edmond. Come on, Mabel Bassett. Come on, Orlando. Father, I thank you right now for touching hearts. I thank you right now that our trust is rising in you. Lord, I feel like I was obedient to what you told me to preach and communicate. Lord, I thank you that right now it's sinking deep in our hearts that you created us. You knit us together in our mother's womb. I thank you that it's sinking deep in our heart that all the days of our lives were ordained by you. And if we will trust you, you'll bring your plan and purpose past in our life. Help us to trust you, I pray. In Jesus' name, you can take a seat and reverently and just, as you are seated, you can just close your eyes and bow your heads because I'm talking to some people who don't know Jesus as the Lord and Savior. I'm talking to some people at every location that you're far from God. And I want you to know that God really does have a plan and purpose for your life. He has a plan. He has a purpose. And the way that you step into God's plan and purpose, the first thing you have to do is surrender your life to him. 
You have to say yes to him. Give Jesus your heart. Give Jesus your life. Say yes to him. Turn away from your sin and turn to Jesus. Some of you used to serve God. You used to serve God. You used to be in God's plan and purpose for your life, but you've taken over your life. You're running your life. You're living wild. You're making bad decisions. You're hanging with the wrong people. Today, recommit your life back to God. Get back in his plan. Get back in his purpose today. He has one for your life. If I'm talking to you right now, you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Or today, you need to rededicate your life to the Lord. You say, Pastor, I want my sins forgiven. I want to live out God's plan and purpose for my life. I'm tired of going my own way, and I want to begin to go God's way. If that's you, as I count to three, would you lift your hand high at every location? And I'm going to lead you in a prayer to say yes to Jesus. One, two, three. Just lift it now. Just lift it now. That's it. I see your hand there. Others, so they see your hand. Others, see your hand. I see your hand there. See your hand there. Others, so they see your hand. Come on, Midwest City. Come on, Northwest. Just lift it high. That's it. That's it. Come on, Edmund. Just lift it high. Online, click the raise your hand button and say, that's me. Come on, Mabel Bassett. Come on, ladies. Just lift it high. So somebody else today, you want to surrender your life to Jesus. Say yes to him and his plan, his purpose for your life. I'm going to ask every hand that's raised to pray this prayer with me and to confess this prayer with your mouth and believe it in your heart and God's going to wash away your sins today. Pray with me now Heavenly Father, I turn away from my sin and I turn my life today over to Jesus Christ. I believe he's the son of God. He died on the cross. He rose again on the third day so that my sins can be forgiven. I turn my life over to Jesus. I will follow Jesus the rest of my life. Thank you for forgiving me today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.